Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Michael Van Dusen, Deputy Director of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the official and living memorial to our 28th president. A hearty welcome to the center. It is a pleasure for the Wilson Center to co-host these panels this afternoon with Cornell University and to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Cornell and Washington program. And it's been a great pleasure for the Woodrow Wilson Center to collaborate with Cornell University on several programs over the last several months. The Woodrow Wilson Center is a public-private institution <coughs> receiving some government funding but raising more than half of its resources from non-appropriated and private sources. The Center's mission is to bring together the scholars and the policymakers, the academics and the business practitioners, and the confident hope that from their dialogue on public policy issues, each will learn from the other, the work of both will be enriched, and better understanding and better policy can emerge. As the only president we've ever had who had a doctorate, Woodrow Wilson spoke eloquently to the challenges and the mutual benefits of bringing these two worlds together. Through more than 600 meetings a year in the presence of about 150 scholars during the course of a year, the center's work and its scholarship commemorates the ideals and concerns of Woodrow Wilson. This is a nonpartisan center for advanced studies, a neutral and civil forum for free, open, serious, and informed dialogue. Our symposium today on red and blue America is in the very best Wilsonian tradition. We are bringing scholars and policymakers together for a dialogue on an important topic. I am pleased to turn the floor over to Dr. Stuart Blumen, Professor of American History at Cornell University. Stuart will moderate the first panel and introduce the speakers. Stuart, the floor is yours, and good to see you back here. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> and uh, let me welcome you all on behalf of uh, the Cornell and Washington program and of Cornell University more generally. And I want to extend that welcome to those people on the Ithaca campus who I believe are teleconferencing with us this afternoon. Uh, we have a, uh, a very distinguished uh, panel uh, to discuss uh, uh, in, uh, for our first part of our program today the electoral dimensions of the red state, blue state issue in American politics today. Uh, this afternoon, after we're con we conclude at 3 o'clock, there will, by the way, be a short intermission at which we'll, and there will be some refreshments between 3 and 3.15, and then we'll reconvene for another <coughs> panel which will talk about the policy implications of the kinds of electoral uh, issues and alignments and uh, potential outcomes that we'll be discussing between 1 and 3. Uh, our panelists are uh, uh, people who have, a, who have very considerably, uh, except with respect to the one issue of their expertise. They are all extremely well qualified in a very personal way to speak on these issues uh, of red and blue America. Let me introduce them very quickly uh, so that they can get started. Uh, if I were to issue complete bios of these four people sitting to my left, we would spend the, we would spend the two hours, uh, and, the, and then you'd only hear from me. Uh, sitting directly to my left, to your right, and that's not a political statement, is uh, Kathleen Frankovic, who is director of surveys for CBS News, where she manages the unit that designs and carries out all of CBS News and CBS News in New York Times polls. She's a senior producer for CBS News election night broadcasts, and indeed leads the team which projects the results of U.S. national and state elections for CBS News. So when we talk about red and blue, this is the person who actually colors the states red and blue. So uh, I, I told you we have quite an extraordinary <laughs> panel. Sitting next to Kathy uh, is uh, Professor Walter Mibben of the Government Department uh, of Cornell University who has his own unique perspectives uh, on these issues, uh, particularly having participated in the uh, Florida recount uh, of two, in the year 2000 and participated as well on behalf, I should, full disclosure, on behalf of the Democratic Party in the uh, 2004 um, uh, Ohio election. Professor Mibben has published widely on electoral issues, on, on issues of um, relating to elections, having to do with incumbency, uh, 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 spending and the like. Uh, he has, uh, you, you may prefer 
to read his robust estimation and outlier detection of overdispersed multinomial uh, models of count data, published in the American Journal of Political Science in 2004. But I'm rather more attractive to the article, The Wrong Man is President, Overvotes in the 2000 <laughs> Presidential Election in Florida. And I trust that we'll be hearing more results more from, from the latter kind of work than from the former, from Professor Mevin. Uh, sitting next to him is his immediate colleague, uh, Professor Ted Lowy, Theodore J. Lowy, who has been the John L. Senior Professor of American Institutions at Cornell since 1972, and I think it's fair to say he was one of America's most distinguished, and has long been one of America's most distinguished political scientists. The author of numerous books, I count 18 or so, uh, uh, and, uh, and 100 or so shorter pieces. Uh, including the personal president, the end of the Republican era, which is uh, the, the latest edition of which will be republished this May. Um, and we're going to hear a lot about that, I think, this afternoon. Um, uh, another forthcoming work with his colleague Isaac Kramnik, uh, the Norton Anthology of American Political Thought. Uh, Ted has been past president of the American Political Science Association, also the Policy Studies Organization, and the International Political Science Association. Uh, and at the end of the table, uh, Carl Lubsdorf, uh, who is the Washington Bureau Chief of the Dallas Morning News and has been since 1981. Uh, uh, prior to that, worked for the Associated Press from 1960 to 1975, although he really should start his journalistic career with a, with a, uh, in a far more distinguished place, the Cornell Daily Sun, with his associate editor, I believe, right? We, did you work for the Sun, yes. too? Yes, well, we have two former Cornell Sun journalists here, um, Kathy being the other. Uh, in any case, Carl worked for the Associated Press from 1960 to 1975 in New Orleans, in New York, and, and in Washington. Uh, from 1976 to 1981, was correspondent uh, for the Washington Bureau of the Baltimore Sun. He is secretary of the Gridiron Club that we will not ask him to sing, uh, and uh, past president of the White House Correspondents Association. Uh, I, I don't have it down here in my notes, but I know that, for, that he was elected one of uh, Washington's 50 uh, outstanding journalists, and so I had to mention that as well. Um, well, uh, that's our panel, uh, two journalists, two professors, uh, four very important and different perspectives. I'm going to ask Carl Lubsdorf to lead things off. Each panel, we'll ask each panelist to talk, uh, to give a brief presentation of perhaps 15 minutes or so, and then I'd like to initiate a wider discussion. I'm sure that won't be difficult. So, Carl? Uh, thanks, Professor Blumen, and I appreciate especially your recalling my collegiate journalistic endeavors. Um, as the husband of a former editor of the Daily Northwestern and the father of the Metro editor currently of the Brown Daily Herald, in our household we think these things are important and the precursor of future great <laughs> things. I, I thought uh, as I walked in here today that it was really sort of appropriate that we were meeting in the Woodrow Wilson Center to talk about politics in the age of George Bush um, because perhaps no president before President Bush of the last hundred years had so expansive a view of exporting democracy to the rest of the world as did President Wilson. And one wonders also whether President Bush will in the end prove as unsuccessful as, as President Wilson in the end proved to be. Um, you referred to the Gridiron Club and, and we put on our show earlier this month and one of the biggest hits in the show was a song called Second Term Blues in which Clarence Page, who's a well-known columnist from the Chicago Tribune, played the role of Karl Rove and bemoaned all the misfortunes that have befallen President Bush since his re-election. Um, there's no doubt that President Bush has fallen quite easily, as it turns out, into that traditional second term pattern of, of a presidency whereby the second term is almost inevitably uh, much less successful than the first. Um, it raises, though, in the context of uh, 2006, the question of whether it's, it's going to lead to another one of those familiar patterns recurring this year. It's the phenomenon known as the six-year itch. That's the pattern in which the party in power suffers substantial losses in congressional elections um, in the sixth year of its term. It's one of the most iron rules of American politics over the past century. 
Woodrow Wilson in 1918, Franklin Roosevelt in 1938, Dwight Eisenhower in 1958, Ronald Reagan in 1986, and it even afflicted t t two cases where there were two presidents who shared the eight years, the Kennedy-Johnson presidency, which took a tremendous blow in the midterm elections of 1966, and of course the Nixon-Ford uh, era and the 1974 elections in, in the middle of Watergate. The only one who has escaped that um, over this period of time was, of all people, Bill Clinton. And one of the reasons was because he had his substantial losses in the second year of his presidency. He didn't have to wait till the sixth year of his presidency. Um, but there are other reasons, too, which, which I'll get into. But for President Bush and the Republicans, the stakes are really enormous. And their margin of error in this fall's elections is really quite narrow. Um, the Democrats need to gain only 15 seats to win control of the House. And that's a number far less than the average of sixth-year elections. Um, it, it's not clear that even if the Democrats won a majority in the House this fall, they'd be able to govern and actually pass legislation. But if they do gain one control of at least one House, certainly they'll be in the position to exercise what they like to call oversight and what the current administration might call something else. Um, there's no doubt there would be many investigations and a lot more scrutiny of what's gone on the last six years than we've had until now. Still, despite the fact that President Bush's poll ratings are currently in the mid-30s, um, lower than I think a lot of us thought they would ever reach, I think we all thought that there might be a floor for him about 40, um, and the fact that the country overwhelmingly in every poll says that they don't like the direction the country is going in. There's no guarantee that there will be a big Democratic victory and a big Republican defeat this fall. In the Senate, the Democrats face the reality that the increasing polarization of the electorate has left the, the nation with all of our states being constantly judged as red states and blue states. And the fact is, there are more red states than blue states. Uh, President Bush carried, I think, 31 states in, one of his elect in the second election and 30 in the first election. And we've increasingly seen a pattern in the Senate whereby states elect senators um, along their ideological lines of the way they vote for president. In the House, the GOP has maximized its majority by using its success in state elections over the past decade to gerrymander the political lines in a way that makes it far harder for the Democrats to elect the 218 seats it needs for a majority. Um, and that situation may continue to get worse because, of course, it's red America, the South and West, which is growing, not blue America, the Northeast. Let me start with the House because I think most of us feel that if one House goes Democratic this fall, it will be the House. Uh, not that you could tell at present if you went district by district. Charlie Cook and Stu Rothenberg, um, who have political newsletters in Washington and probably do the most detailed analysis of elections, um, on, a, on a weekly basis. Both are predicting that at the moment the Republicans are likely to keep control of the House, although with a reduced majority. And both cite sort of the same reason, that there are so few seats really in play that the Democrats have to score almost a clean sweep of available seats to win the House. Cook recently estimated that there are only 32 seats out of the 435 that are really at play at this point, of which 21 are held by Republicans. So the Democrats, in order to win, would have to hold all 11 of their seats that are contested hotly and win 15 of those 21 seats, a number of them against incumbents. Um, that, that's not easy in these days when, when incumbents run for re-election, they tend mostly to get re-elected. Um, a strong national tide could overcome that, um, but um, the dis we've created a situation with the you know, work of both parties whereby more and more congressional districts are absolutely locked in for the Republicans and for the Democrats. In state after state, the, the two parties have gotten together to protect incumbents, and then the one that had the majority gave itself a few more districts. Um, the other thing that affects the House is the republicanization of the South. The South was, of course, once the bluest 
part of the country, solidly democratic, as, as many of you know, and it's become pretty solidly Republican. I looked up some figures on it, and it's really striking. In 1990, if you take the 11 states that were in the Confederacy, plus Kentucky and Oklahoma, uh, they had 85 Democrats and 44 Republicans in the House. Today, those states have 91 Republicans and 51 Democrats. Um, it's, it's almost a reversal, and of course they have more members than they had uh, 15 years ago. The rest of the country has also gone more Republican, from 182 to 123 Democratic to 151 to 146 Democratic. It's not that the Republicans have gained so many seats, they've gained 18, it's that the Democrats have lost a lot as districts have been eliminated because of the m movement of the population south and west. Um, but there are several states in which the Republicans have done uh, what experts on reapportionment would consider an excellent job of reapportioning, but which the opposition party would think is totally undemocratic. Um, in Michigan, Pennsylvania, for example, those are two states that are pretty evenly balanced politically. They, they tend to vote Democratic a little more in presidential elections, but they've elected quite a few Republican governors. Um, at the moment, Michigan has nine Republicans in the House and six Democrats. Pennsylvania has 12 Republicans and seven Democrats. Then there are the Sunbelt states, um, where this has happened to an even greater degree. Florida now has 18 Republicans and seven Democrats. And Texas has 21 Republicans and 11 Democrats. And in fact, we have you know, with us today you know, someone who epitomizes the reapportionment and what happened in Texas, a former Congressman Martin Frost of Dallas, who's in the front row here, um, who was the most senior Democratic member of the House from Texas, and who, would, because of the reapportionment that the Republicans put through in 2003, and, um, was put in a district that was almost impossible for him to win, which he was not able to win. Um, that case is currently before the Supreme Court. The Democrats hope to get some relief there, but based on the history of these sorts of things, um, that would seem to be unlikely. The, as I mentioned, that the you know the, not only are the are the seats malapportioned, but incumbents are tremendously protected, which makes it the Democrats have to depend on a number of Republican members retiring from the House, creating open seats which are easier to win, and that may be in fact be happening. Um, several senior Republicans have, in recent weeks, decided to retire. Ironically, and it's not the subject for today, but it, it has something to do with term limits. The Republicans decided not only that they really didn't favor term limits for themselves as far as being elected to Congress, but they would decide to term limit their committee chairman. And several senior Republicans whose terms as committee chairman are ending this year because of term limits have decided that if they can't be chairman, they just as soon not be in the House, and they're retiring. And a number of these seats, I think, are going to be up for grabs this fall. The one thing the Democrats have going for them at this point is the national mood. And as I mentioned, the, the public is very turned off on the, on the way things are going at the moment. Um, the generic polls, which are sometimes indicative of the way the vote will go in terms of popular vote for the House, is so heavily Democratic at this point, up to about 16 percent Democratic lead in some of them. Um, I think it would be impossible to have a national vote that would be pro-democratic by 16 percent and not have enough districts somewhere along the line fall so the Democrats won control of the House. And I think many people now, including some Republicans, think that if the elections were held today that the Democrats would in fact win the House. And I think no one in this room should be surprised if they wake up on the morning after the election and discover perhaps 220 Democrats and 215 Republicans in the next House of Representatives. The Senate, I think, is much more dicey for the Democrats. And as I mentioned, the nature of the Senate, with two from every state, and the fact that states are tending to vote more for senators the way they vote for presidential elections helps the Republicans. If 30 states are, are red states and 20 states are blue states, um, you can see how the numbers work in favor of the Republicans in the Senate. Um, let me mention again the South, because the figures in the Senate are almost more dramatic than in the, 
than in the House. In 1990, the 11 Deep South states had 15 Democratic senators and seven Republicans. Today, those states have four Democratic senators and 18 Republican senators. That's a gain of 11. Um, that's, that 11 is exactly the number of Republicans in the current Senate more than the Senate of 1990. In other words, the rest of the country has stayed the same. The swing in the South has turned the Senate from a Democratic Senate to a Republican Senate. The Democrats have a bigger, another problem this year in that only 15 of the 33 states that are up for election are held by the Republicans. Um, so that means the Democrats would have to win six of those, which is 40% of them, to win control, assuming they didn't lose any of their own, own seats. At present, the Democrats have a good chance of unseating two Republican senators who represent blue states. Rick Santorum in Pennsylvania is running about 15 points behind Bob Casey, the conservative Democrat who's challenging him. And in Rhode Island, Senator Lincoln Chafee, um, the polling there is a little bit uncertain. It's, Rhode Island is a hard state to poll. For one thing, it's very hard to poll Republicans because there's so few of them um, in Rhode Island. Um, but in any case, Senator Chafee has a, has a Republican primary fight and a pretty strong Democratic opponent and is clearly in, in great difficulty there. The next Democratic targets, though, are all red states. So that requires that the Democrats do well in states that President Bush carried, in mo most cases, twice. Now, one is Ohio. And in Ohio, there is this major Republican scandal involving the governor and, and some other office holders, which has left the Republican <coughs> Party there in shambles. And I saw a survey today that showed that the Democrat, Sherrod Brown, who's a congressman, is running eight or nine points ahead of uh, Michael DeWine, the, the Republican incumbent. Um, another state is Missouri. Jim Talent, who's a first-termer there, um, is running behind in the polls. Um, and another one is Montana, where Conrad Burns um, has been involved some with Jack Abramoff. And his, he's considered to be in so much difficulty that he may now have a primary fight within his own party. Those are the seats that are Republican held that the Democrats, you know, those, that's five. That gets them to 50-50. Well, Dick Cheney is still vice president and likely to remain so. So that means the Democrats, in order to organize the Senate, need 51 seats. That 51st seat is the problem. Um, the one in which they probably have the best chance, and when I describe the race to you, you'll see why it's such a long shot, is in Tennessee where Bill Frist is retiring from the Senate, and the Democratic candidate is going to be Harold Ford, the uh, young and charismatic African-American congressman from Memphis. Um, but it is not all, at all clear that someone even as attractive and able as Congressman Ford can be elected statewide in a state, in a state like that. So th the Senate looks dicey. The House looks better. So let me close with just one note. Congressional elections are notoriously hard to predict six months in advance, especially the House. The Senate, we sort of know what the dynamics and who the candidates are. But next fall, I guarantee you'll be reading about House races that are at play that no one ever thought would be. Um, and remember this, too. If President Bush's standing goes up and most of us think it can't go down further, that'll give the Republicans a boost and they might actually keep the House. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. <clears throat> and that's the voice from inside the Beltway. Uh, we will go uh, outside the Beltway, I guess, to some extent. And Kathy? Yeah, outside the belt Beltway as far as New York City, I guess. That doesn't, yeah. quite, doesn't quite make it. Um, I have uh, my own Cornell. You here? Yeah, I have my own Cornell Sun story to tell. Um, the first year I was at Cornell, I was on the sports board of the Cornell Sun, and that was a year when um, women were, as of then, not allowed in Ivy League press boxes. So I covered things like squash and tennis. Um, but my, the closest I ever came to football was covering a graduate student game that involved Professor Lowy, and I <laughs> did my. <laughs> it was in his first incarnation at Cornell. And um, I did an interview with him. I was terrified to make this phone call. Um, and everybody said he was such a nice person. So it's, 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 he doesn't remember this. But, uh, but it definitely seared an imprint on my, on my, on my brain. Um, apparently, it was a good game. 
Um, any rate, I'm going to take this a little differently, and I'm going to talk about Red and Blue America uh, sort of in, in terms of political discourse and in terms of political polarization, presenting a little data from um, elections, um, but also talking about the way we, we deal with, with one another. Um, it, it's, there's been a change in the last 15 years in the way we, we talk about politics and the way we hear about politics. We, we learn things in different ways. Um, and the change was evident in the 1994 congressional election, which is great for um, a panel that's about, starts with the Gingrich Revolution. Um, in that election, in the uh, voter news service exit polls that we all, we all subscribe to, 21% of all voters said they listened to radio talk shows that focused on politics, and two-thirds of that group voted Republican. If you do the calculation, you can make the argument that this group turned that election and made it the, um, and gave the Republicans the majority in the, House of, in the House of Representatives. Two years later, when this question was asked again, uh, more people said that they listened and there was a far more even partisan split. So that um, Kathleen Hall Jamison talks about this and talks about talk radio as a way people learn how to interpret the news. Um, they're being told by people how they should read the press, how they should listen to television, how they should deal with the main, mainstream media, and clearly many Americans are getting their information that way and dealing with that, with that information. I think that what we've seen in the last 15 years is we've seen Americans learning how they're supposed to respond in elections and how they're supposed to respond to, to pollsters. They also have learned new ways of responding to information that they don't agree with and to challenges um, to, their, to their expectations. And in the process, this has changed the way the news media operates and certainly changed the way people like me um, who do public opinion polls uh, both operate and, um, and interpret and present um, our, our information. Um, I have four charts here coming from four presidential elections, and it's the relationship of partisanship and voting behavior. In other words, among Republicans, this is 1992, how many voted for Bill Clinton? That's the yellow bar. How many voted for George, George in that case, H.W. Bush? That's the sort of um, pink <coughs> bar. And then the dark, deep red is how many voted for Ross Perot? The, the interesting number is the number at the bottom. And you'll see four charts going from 1992 through 2004. In 1992, the difference in the vote for the Republican versus the Democrat um, among Republicans was 63. The difference for Democrats, in other words, the percentage who voted for Bill Clinton versus the percentage who voted for George Bush, um, was 67. So basically, there was a, a, a very clear partisan divide with about uh, two-thirds in each party differentiating between the Democrat and the Republican. If you move to 1996, that gap, this is post-Gingrich Revolution, that gap increases and increases about 10 points so that among the Republicans, there's a difference in the vote of 77 points between the vote for uh, Bob Dole and the vote for Bill Clinton. For the Democrats, the difference was 74 points. In other words, 74% more Democrats voted for Clinton than voted for Dole. You get to the year 2000, and it increases even more to 83 points for Republicans to 75 points for Democrats. Fewer than 10% of Republicans voted for Al Gore, and just over 10% of Democrats voted for George W. Bush. And finally, when we get to 2004, the difference is even higher, 87 points for Republicans, 78 <coughs> points for Democrats. Here it is charted from, from year to year. Um, going from 1992 to 2004, the gap in vote for the Democrat and the Republican candidate, the absolute value of that um, among Republicans and among Democrats. So we've had a movement in terms of members of political parties to really being more polarized in their voting behavior and more predictable in their voting behavior. There really hasn't been a big change in the number of people who call themselves Republicans or call themselves Democrats. Back in 1992, the figure was, th uh, in the exit polls, was 38% identifying as Democrats, 35% identifying as Republicans. In 2004, it was 37% and 37%. I mean, differences of very, very small differences. Um, but we have seen a difference in the way they think about their vote and how they vote. 
And this difference extends to other issues. Um, I was looking the other day and I found this and I was so pleased. Um, in, in 1992, in June 1992, this is just a little over a year after the end of the Persian Gulf War, George, um, George Bush had a 34% approval rating. Republicans, the approval rating among Republicans was 55%, the approval rating among Democrats was 18%. So the difference between Republican approval of the president and Democratic approval of the president was 37 points. That's a gap, but it's not, eh, it's, I've heard that, it's, it's coming. In March of 2006, that's this month, the CBS News poll, um, the approval rating of George W. Bush was 34%, but look at the difference. The approval rating among Republicans was 74%. The approval rating among Democrats was 6%. In other words, the difference between Republican and Democrat approval of President Bush had gone, the difference with the same approval rating, 34%, not good, had gone from a 37-point gap to a 68-point gap. Um, and again, this is clearly part and parcel of people knowing who they are and how they're supposed to respond when they're asked how they feel about a president. Um, that Republican approval rating, by the way, is, is among the lowest of the Bush administration. Um, it had been um, 90 points, close to 90 points, um, up, and, up through really the start of this, of this calendar year. Um, talk about policies of those presidents. This is a question, was the US military action against the Iraq, Iraq the right thing to do? asked in 1991, that's not the complete text of the question, but, but that's the thrust of the question, asked in 1991, asked in 2003, and asked in 2006. And again, the differences between Republicans and Democrats on that question, the gap in 1991 went from 25 points to 37 points at the start, close to the start of the, of the war in Iraq in 2003, and now has increased to 51 points. So issues are dividing partisans, and partisans are recognizing that those issues, issues divide them. Um, in, in, in brief, basically, Americans have learned what they are supposed to believe. Um, they may have learned it in, in numerous ways. They may have learned it from, from the guides of, of talk radio or, or, um, or magazines who tell Republicans how they're supposed to think, who tell Democrats what they're supposed to think. Um, and while party distribution has changed relatively little in the aggregate, party divisions have increased. Um, so, you know, coming out of this, it's perfectly reasonable that we talk about a culture war. It's perfectly reasonable that we talk about the prevalence of the red state, blue state concept. Um, it shows up in elections. We see it. We may put too much emphasis on it, but it is definitely there. And there are other divisions that re reinforce these party differences. Um, differences in religion and religiosity in particular that divide Republicans and Democrats. Differences in race that divide Republicans and Democrats. Differences in urbanity. If you look at a map of the United States on election night, you see red states and blue states. But if people are going to show you votes by counties, you see even more stark divisions with huge Democratic margins in urban areas and basically the entire rest of the country except for isolated pockets being red. Um, a state like California, which we think of as a blue state, is basically a blue state because of the Los Angeles area, the San Francisco area, and a few other places, not the inland counties at all. Um, so when partisans are on the same side as they turned out to be um, for the Dubai ports deal, it's really, it's really quite news and quite, it's quite, quite exciting, really, um, to see this happening because it doesn't happen very often. Um, and it doesn't happen in, in, in a way because, because people are trained as well to tune out information that doesn't agree with what they think. Um, back in, before the, uh, the 1994, um, candidates attacked the polls. They always attacked the polls. It sort of was the thing you did. But it was, it was a, a thing that was done sort of almost as a by the by. The, by. Um, the only poll that counts is the one on election day, it would be repeated over and over by a trailing candidate in the poll. Or polls don't vote, people do. Or my favorite example of that, which is in 1988, when Michael Dukakis turned that into pollsters don't vote, people do. I took it personally. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in 1992, two quotes from speeches um, by Bill Clinton and, and George Bush 
Bill Clinton, you know, when I, was in that, when I announced Mr. Bush was at 70% in the polls, and I really don't think even my mother thought I could win. So sort of accepting the poll numbers as the, as the campaign changed. And of course, using the polls to attack your opponent, not to attack the polls. Um, as George Bush would say, Clinton's looked at the polls. He's seen the American people want NAFTA. So yesterday he said he's for it. And then again, maybe he's not. Um, a usage of the polls in a campaign, which is basically to attack your opponent by saying, he follows the polls and doesn't think for himself. Now it seems to be quite a bit different. Um, and, and, and it does start in 1992 in Bush's speeches towards the end. He did use words like crazy and nutty to describe pollsters. And sometimes he said they were inhaling. Um, in, in, in 1996, Bill Clinton is, actually uses the word methodology which is not a word you hear presidential candidates say very often, basically complaining about what he was seeing, said, well, there are so many differences in the polls. Aren't there established methodologies? Aren't there ways you're supposed to do those, those things? By 2004, you not only have candidates doing that, but you have the, the people around candidates doing that. Um, in June of 2004, the language was particularly harsh. Um, Republicans called, said the New York Times was, was doing a bogus political survey uh, because they interviewed, quote, too many many Democrats, and Matthew Dowd, who some of you may know as um, a pollster for the president, um, actually said a note of caution, be very careful in reporting the Los Angeles Times poll, it is a mess. Um, in September of 2004, the state Republican chair called for the, the firing or the resignation of the person who ran the Minnesota poll. Um, and this attack continued throughout the fall with picketers in front of the Minneapolis Star Tribune carrying signs and saying, hey, hey, ho, ho, Rob Daves has got to go. Um, he gives a great presentation on, 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 on this. But, you know, this is, this is an attack from Republicans on the, on the polls. There also were attacks from the other direction. Um, MoveOn.org took out a full-page ad in the New York Times, um, galloping to the right, why does America's top pollster keep getting it wrong, which fundamentally accused the Gallup poll of inter interviewing too many Republicans because the son of the founder cared about religion. And it's a personal attack on the individual um, taken out in, spent the money for a full page ad in the New York Times. Um, so basically the modern polling environment and the modern, modern basically political environment as I see it, you have a situation with high speed news coverage, great visibility, you have um, a tool which has been used for a long time and accepted as precise and accurate measurement um, and sanctioned sort of as an expert in a political proceeding that now is being challenged from the political side um, on its methodology. Throughout the 2004 campaign, there were news stories about how can the polls be correct, they don't interview people who have cell phones. There were stories about low response rates. There were stories about likely voter models and how they differed. There were stories about whether or not you should weight polls by party identification. Is there a right number of Republicans and Democrats? Which sort of put into um, the, the view of the informed citizen um, a, a, a set of questioning beliefs um, about something that up to some point in time had been sort of accepted as face value. Now it's probably a good thing, but it does sort of, of, of underscore some of the other criticisms that have emerged over the last 15 years and the heightened uh, negativity of political um, discourse. Um, I think that um, there are some implications of this. Um, I think that it, is, it, it sets up um, a situation where there now is no grant of objectivity um, in political discourse, in political dialogue to, um, to individuals, to journalists, to, um, to pollsters, to survey researchers that there's an assumption that there are, is, is no such thing as experts um, because those experts can be attacked and are attacked. Um, I think we see a lot of debate on um, the 24-hour news stations, that position a partisan versus someone who in another era might have been thought of as, um, as, a, as an objective observer, and that includes, of course, faculty members um, and, and professors, and the attacks are, are magnified by the echo chamber. Now we're not talking talk radio as much as we're talking about internet blogs. 
Um, several years ago, if you looked for um, commentary about the media, it was pretty much coming from the right. Now if you look at commentary from the media and you look at the list of websites of which there is commentary on the media, you find pretty much an equal division between left and right, um, basically with both sides um, doing what um, talk radio may have done in 1994, training their readers how to interpret information that they, that they get. And I think these changes and these, these things were clearly much more effective because of the intensity of the 2000 and 2004 campaign and the polarization uh, between the parties and between party supporters. I mean, 2004, for example, um, it was a year when two-thirds of voters said they were paying a lot of attention to the campaign. Typically, that figure is less than half. Um, it was a year when um, 70, uh, more than three-quarters said that this election was very important to them and their families, and also a year when half of the electorate said that they would be scared if one or the other candidate were going to win. So finally, looking ahead to 2008, the different quarter, you know, a quarter were scared if Bush were to win and a quarter would be scared if, um, if John Kerry were to win. I mean, I certainly think that in the 2008 election we'll have the same kind of similar intense polarization. Um, the, the split is too close. The partisans are too attached to their view. There are very few candidates who appeal across party lines, one who does. Um, John McCain gets pretty much equivalent favorable ratings from Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, but that's partly because his favorable ratings among Republicans are pretty low for a Republican candidate. Um, and even national security issues have been, have been politicized. Um, military actions have been politicized. And the public has learned which positions they, they should take. So, you know, absent major crisis or some sort of unifying issue, um, I really don't see anything more than close elections and divisions that are going to face us um, for at least the, the, the foreseeable future. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Kathy. M might I ask, why, why don't we hear more of this on CBS News? <laughs> <laughs> Should I write a letter? <laughs> All right, okay, Walter. Uh, Walter, we're going to turn to the professors now. Uh, time for a nap. Uh, I, I, I trust not. I trust not. We're not quite ready. E equals MC squared. <laughs> well, what does it mean? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Um, I should say something about the wrong man as president, uh, even though that's not what I'm going to talk about mostly uh, in my presentation here. Uh, this is referring to the 2000 election, especially looking at the election in Florida. And what I did was look at um, ballots where people attempted to vote but were frustrated by deficient voting machines and deficient administration, election administration practices. And I think it's very hard to argue against the claim that in Florida, um, most of the people who went to the polls and intended to vote for a presidential candidate, um, more of them voted for uh, Al Gore than voted for George Bush, even though the official vote count came out differently. Uh, in the 2004 election, I had the interesting experience of working as a consultant for the Democratic National Committee, which is not quite working for the Democratic National Committee as an advocate. Um, and I had the almost out-of-body experience of spending all my time arguing that George Bush won the 2004 election, which he certainly did in Ohio. And there, if you look at the data, it's very hard to argue that, um, that it's very hard to argue that Kerry got more votes than Bush. And so it's been an interesting uh, row there. And I'm currently doing some stuff looking at whether America can actually accurately count the votes in elections, which you think would be easy, but turns out not to be so easy. And anyway, what I want to talk about today, though, is the red and blue America topic. And um, the work I want to present is um, nicely Cornellian in the sense that it is largely the work of a student, uh, Jeffrey Wolf uh, Schatz, who took my campaign and election course last fall and was intrigued by a book um, published by Morris Fiorina, who's a very well-known political scientist from Stanford, a book called Culture War, question uh, mark. And Fiorina takes the contrarian view that all this red and blue America stuff is overblown uh, and misattributed. Fiorina's claim is that it's not really that the electorate is polarized and divided, Instead, it's the political elites who are polarized and divided. So parties, candidates, activists are more extreme, and the, the center is vacant, 
in those categories, says Fiorina. But the public, he says, is not uh, as dramatically divided. And so he has uh, taking on these issues of the culture war, which uh, is dramatically different from what you might call an economic war, which does not exist um, as represented by books such as What's the Matter with Kansas, uh, raising the question of why uh, in that author's telling people who economically would benefit from having a different political view are mesmerized by their, by their cultural uh, affinities. Um, so issues like abortion and gay marriage and other kind of tolerance kind of questions um, seem to be what are the culture war kind of issues. So uh, Jeff Schatz um, found this argument by Fiorina to be unpersuasive and wrote a very nice paper. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the things that he did. Um, I've encouraged him to try to continue to get this stuff published. So maybe someone here wants to publish it after you see this work. I have some technical questions about his work, which I'll talk to him about, but I'm not going to belabor that today. I think basically if you make some changes, you get roughly the same, end up in the same position that he does. So the Schatz 2005 citation, which you see at the bottom of this slide, refers to this paper that he wrote for my course. And all the slides here are tables that come from uh, his paper uh, with a couple of slight changes in a couple of cases. Um, and so the first thing here is the main ar counter argument that uh, Jeff makes against Fiorina is that the red state, blue state distinction insists on classifying every single American state as either red or blue. And he says, well, actually, there are some states that are swing states. Um, you could go ahead and call them purple, I guess, but I'm not going to go there. Um, so there are swing states. There are some places that you might, at the state level, say are dramatically uncompetitive for the other party. And here he calls those strong Republican states or strong Democratic states, which are classified as states where the, um, the, the electoral average of the national uh, electorate in the presidential election these states were more than five percentage points away from the average, either favoring the Republicans or the Democrats. And so that's, you know, not very competitive. And so these are the really uh, core places that you might want to call red or blue. Other places that are within, um, I believe he has two and a half percentage points, are up for grabs. And this is within two and a half percent of the national average. And so you might have an election, it's a landslide election, and the candidate wins 49 states. But still, you're looking for the deviation around that that large uh, average favoring the Republican or Democrat, as the case may be, whichever election you're looking at. And so what you can see here is that not all states, not all 50 are classified as either strong for one of the parties or as a swing state. There are some that are in the middle. Um, but the red and blue state insist on calling these swing states, uh, such as Ohio. Um, Jeff is particularly appalled to see Ohio and Florida called um, red states when they're clearly competitive in his view. Um, and so you can see that um, his point in this table one, it starts at the bottom with 1984, classifying states in this way. And he says the first major point is that the number of strong states or non-competitive states has roughly doubled, going from 84 to 2004. So if you're looking for increased polarization or lack of competition geographically, then he says this is a pretty good indication that there's something going on. And of course, what could be going on is a concentration of campaign resources. Uh, campaigns may be just deciding not to run in some places. And so if they give up a state, it's not going to be so close. So this is not decisive evidence that the voters are more polarized. But still, it's a big, pretty big sign that something significant is going on. Uh, the number of swing states also decreases um, from the beginning to the end of the series by roughly half. And so, you know, there's a pretty good sign that there's a strong polarization, though this particular table doesn't necessarily prove it's the voters that are doing so. So the next thing he says, well, one reason that Fiorina ends up with, in many of his analyses, uh, finding very uh, close differences between the voters in the red states and the blue states, is that he has taken the strong states, the uncompetitive states, and smooshed them together with states that, while painted red or blue, are actually swing states. And so if you separate out the non-competitive states or the strong states here, you end up um, using some measures that um, are similar to what Fiorina did with a table that looks like this. And the numbers on the left columns come from uh, Fiorina's book, uh, the, the first edition. The second edition is just out, but he doesn't take anything back from the first edition, he, Fiorina. And so these charts remain the same. And Fiorina is using data from a, a Pew study. Uh, Jeff went and looked at national election studies data from 2000. So the questions aren't exactly the same, and the sample is not exactly the same. But nonetheless, 
you get the uh, pretty good message here that in Fiorina's study, you can see that on a question asking whether women should have an equal role or whether women's home places in the home, roughly that kind of question, this percentage is the number of people who agree that the women's role should be equal. And red and blue states, which classifies all 50 states, you know, either red or blue, you have pretty close numbers there. On an abortion issue, asking whether abortion should always be legal, you see some difference, 11-point uh, difference, which Fiorina argues is not dramatic polarization. It's a difference, but it's not that, that large, according to Fiorina. And on the question of whether gays should be able to adopt children, you can see there's about a 12-point difference. Uh, again, it's, it's noticeable, but it's not all that large. In contrast, Jeff notes, if you look at the strong states, the non-competitive states, either the strong Republican or the strong Democratic states, and the red are the strong Republican and the blue here are the strong Democratic states, you can see that all the gaps are much larger. Uh, you move to a 17-point gap on the women's equal role question, um, and you might ask why this 80 percent is smaller than 83 percent, but it's not really all that critical since it's different, uh, different surveys. Um, and but 63 percent in 2000 arguing that they disagree that a woman has an equal role. It's pretty uh, dramatic. Um, on the abortion issue, you can see there's a 30-point gap if you compare the strong states, red and blue, which is starting to look like a pretty dramatic gap, and a 24% uh, gap on the, on the gay adoption uh, kind of issue. So he says, uh, Jeff says, and you know, this point seems to be pretty sound, by adding in what are really closely contested states, within those states you might have counties, as Kathy pointed out, that are not competitive, but on the, the state as a whole is pretty competitive, um, you end up uh, making things look closer than they would be. Um, the next question that Jeff addresses, is, of course, is whether there's been a change. We started off looking at a doubling of the number of non-competitive states and a halving of the number of sort of swing states. Is that matched by a change in attitudes um, over time? So can you see increased polarization on the part of the voters? And so there are three displays that he computed using national election study data combined with his classification of states as uh, competitive or non-competitive. And so here we're looking at the strong uh, states, and there are two different classifications you can use. There are lots, there are lots of them, but he used two here. One is to take the strong and uh, states, the non-competitive states, as of 1984, and use that classification of states for six different years of National Election Studies data. The other is to start at the end and take the states that in 2004 were uh, non-competitive and use that classification for all six of these uh, years. So the six years of difference here are looking at the National Election Studies survey data, and the classifications are coming from the actual election returns data. Okay? So um, if you compare the 1984 gap, I'll just take these and you can then look at the, the differences, and there are two different points I want to make. The first point is just that the gap, by the time you get to the end, seems to be larger than the gap that you uh, get at the beginning in uh, these three issues. Here's the abortion always legal issue, and you can see there's a six-point gap in 1984 using the 1984 definition of strong uh, Republican and strong uh, Democratic states. Uh, by the time you get to 2004, using the 2004 definition, you have a 25% gap in this question. Uh, so that's a dramatic increase in the number of and then the, between the voters. Of course, it's different states, and so we might also look at the tendency as we go down across time, looking at the same states over time. And here the picture's a little more ambiguous, and maybe, uh, maybe Mo's getting a little back, Mo Fiorina's getting a little back on Jeff here. Uh, because if you look at the 1984 states that were um, strong uh, for one party or the other, the gap kind of closes. And so by the time you get to 2004, with these 1984 red and blue uh, states, really red and blue states, you find not much of a difference on the abortion issue, uh, at least on the always legal aspect of that question. But if you look at the 2004 strong and weak um, blue, red, uh, blue states and go backwards, you see that that gap has pretty much held its own throughout the entire time period. Um, and so we're starting to get a little bit of ambiguity here, um, but the abortion issue is not typical of the other two. Here's the second issue, um, and this is basically a question not about gay adoption, but about uh, whether there should be laws that prevent discrimination against gays. And so the same setup is here, and so you can see that in 1988, there's not much of a difference between 
the red and blue, uh, strong red and blue states. This is uh, Jeff Schatz's definition of the red and blue states. Whereas when you get to 2004, using the 2004 definition, there's a 23% uh, gap. And so that's a dramatic expansion. If you do the comparison across time, now we find an increasing gap over time in the same states. So using the 1984 definition, you have, by the time you get to 2004, about a 17% difference between the red and blue states. Um, and that same kind of a, a, an increase in the gap is not really present, but there's a persistent gap using the 2004 definition. Here, though, there's an interesting thing which one shouldn't note about where this distinction between the strong red and the strong blue states is. And I'll just point out, using this, the 2004 definition, the strong blue states in 1984 had 59% of people agreeing that there should be laws to prevent discrimination against gays. By 2004, in the NES data, the strong red states had 60% saying there should be such laws. So even though you have a persistent gap between the red and blue states, according to this measure, the red states are coming along toward the direction that the blue states were. So you sort of ask yourself, how do we get to a place where gay marriage is the issue as opposed to, you know, should teach in schools, kind of old questions like that. It's because you have this increasing move toward, um, in this particular case, um, support of um, prevention of discrimination against gays and, in fact, using the state to prevent such discrimination. The third and last question uh, which he looks at or that I'll present uh, looks at this women's equal role kind of question and it's pretty much uh, tracking in some sense the uh, gay marriage, the, excuse me, the gay rights thing and in other cases it's looking like the abortion thing. If you look at the 84 definition you see a seven point gap uh, between the red and blue states which pretty much disappears by the time you get to the end of the period. So this is again sort of Fiorina's culture war argument which is at least on the women's role issue it doesn't seem to be persisting all that much but of course, if you look at the states that by 2004 were strongly polarized in the presidential voting, you have a gap of, I guess that's 21%, um, and it's larger than it was in uh, 2000, in 1984, in those same states. So these poor benighted red states, or the, um, the blue states, whatever they are, seem to be places where you have an increasing separation involving uh, sort of women and uh, abortion rights. Um, but on, uh, on the gay rights issue, it seems that there's some progress, uh, even though the, the gap between the red and the blue uh, continues. Um, so I'm not sure whether this leaves uh, Fiorina's argument in tatters or whether it shows that he's right to stand up against the routine uh, use in the media. And you've heard it today by uh, prominent uh, people looking at polls and talking to the conventional wisdom in the media, where you see red and blue states and projecting that onto the voters but I think it substantially complicates that and shows that while you have a gap, you still might have that there's not the same degree of bias. Um, there maybe the whole culture war has shifted to be a more nuanced kind of war about details. <coughs> and also you find persistent differences, but the differences are in some places and not in others. So um, I think the red and blue looking forward, who knows what 2008 will be. Um, it will probably be a, a, an election about war um, more than anything else, and probably also a little bit about culture and probably the economy. Um, but I think at that, that I'll, I'll stop, and um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. And now, uh, Professor Lowy, Ted. I'm going to take the podium. Good. Let me turn this off. Fascinating. Okay, that's going to go off. All right. I hear a bit of murmuring in the room, and I don't want to compete with that, okay? Thank you. I'm just trying to bring you back to Cornell. We're a distance away. I even have a handout, which makes you feel at home. You're hearing analysis, which you don't hear down here. Uh, you do on the campus. So you're here for us. You've come to Ithaca for a few minutes. So uh, I expect the normal respect and everything else. I'd like to make a comment about my colleagues to get us going on the discussion period, if we can. I made some notes as they were 
there, and I don't want to miss out on this. I want to create some dissension here. First, I want to tell you another of the secrets of, uh, of uh, Kathy. She started out with no intention of being in the polling behavior business. She was a Southeast Asian Studies student. How's that for a turnaround? I don't know what happened if the American public got her interested or whether she just got bored with George Kahn. I'm not sure which it was. <laughs> I also say that I have a photograph, Kathy, of that one of those ball games that we played against the student, grad students. And on the front line were Clinton Rossiter, Lowy, of course, uh, Walter Lefebvre, Don Kagan, I forget, there are a couple of others of familiar faces. Uh, I, was, I wasn't the youngest of the crowd. Walter Fever was actually the youngest of the crowd. But anyway, uh, we, should, we kept playing until our wives got together and said, we can't insure you well enough, but you quit playing that game. So we quit after that. Anyway, Mibben actually was six feet four in white before he started cutting in Florida. <laughs> so take a look. And uh, as far as Carl is concerned, I learned that he really does hate Dallas. So uh, those are secrets they can share any of, them, of mine that they might want to reveal. But uh, anyway, that gets your attention. Anyway, the Republican Party died. Now, institutions don't really disappear and collapse, but we can say it morphed into something else, such that those who voted Republican did not get at all what they hoped for. I see some nods with those who might have intended to vote Republican, but think about that for a minute while I go on with this and try to, to uh, flesh it out. The Republican Party has morphed into something that I'd like to describe here, but I'll hold on to that and take a, a little backward look. That'll make you also comfortable with being back at Cornell again. The Republican Party had been a libertarian party, the party of Adam Smith since Lincoln. The Lincoln Party was the party of freedom, anti-government or at least small government, capitalism, wide and uh, welcome to immigration, all the things that were part of the Republican Party, it was the liberal party. In the proper sense of the word liberal, damn you folks for calling it conservative. Those who like the free market aren't conservatives, they're the original bloody libertarians. Will you go along with me for a minute on that, okay? <laughs> that was the Republican Party. The Democratic Party was the conservative party in the proper sense of the word. They were planter economy, they were antagonistic and fearful of capitalism, and they believe firmly in the fact that there's a moral order that should be defended. That's conservative. And that was the Democratic Party, a Southern Party. That remained the case with the kinds of things we'd have a semester to deal with, with the development of those two parties. But the Republican Party remained that Libertarian Party right on through, through Herbert Hoover, through Ike Eisenhower, through Richard Nixon, and through Ronald Reagan. The Democratic Party had gone through another transformation to become a liberal party when they absorbed progressives and so on in the 1930s and beyond. So for a while there we had two liberal parties competing against each other. Europeans understood that, two liberal parties. And by all accounts in any country that has any political thought at all, liberalism is an ideology right of center because they're pro-capitalist. The left should be defined as those people who feel capitalism is wrong. It's an immoral way to deal with people by being based on the pursuit of greed. The pursuit of, you remember that speech in, uh, in that wonderful uh, Wall Street film when, when Gordon Gecko stands up and took my line. <laughs> greed is great. America's built on greed. That's liberalism. Pursue what thou wilt. And both parties competed along liberal lines, a different attitude by degree on when the government should be involved, but still, that was liberalism in both parties. Everybody understood that but us. We're liberal parties. Now, something began to happen, and that is, you can see on the graph, on the handout, it won't bother you. This is easier to follow than some of those figures you got up there. I just don't use the machine. I'm still stuck back in the mimeograph period. Some of you guys don't even know what we're talking about. Go to a museum and look for a mimeograph machine, okay? I mean, laser printer, that's a weird business, you know. Printer's enough. I laser printer, my God. Anyway, I drink a quart of piston seal whenever I go into my office with all that paraphernalia around there. Anyway, you can see that while the Democratic Party remained until its collapse in the late 60s, remained 
the Liberal Party and the Republicans seem to be the same, although they started calling themselves, I'm an economic conservative or whatever I used to like to say. In any event, something was happening to the Republican Party. The Democratic Party was easy to understand because it collapsed and lost its vision in the late 1960s and has never gotten it back. That's a secret they don't like to reveal. They never got back any sense of what they'd been before. Let's not worry about the Democrats. It's the Republicans who are the problem and the Republicans who are the secret to what's going to come after 19... I mean, after... Uh, sorry, I'm in, so cutting the wrong, symph the wrong century uh, in, the, in the next 2008 election. It's a coalition. It follows Newt Gingrich. These things had been growing inside the, the Republican Party for a while with the Southerners, the Southern conservatives beginning to get more comfortable with conservatives in the, in the Sun Belt who had different approaches to conservatism, though underlined underneath it were common shared ideologies. The same with the, the Christian, the Protestant right and the Catholic right got together for the first time in history. First time in history. Coming in the late 70s and on into the 80s, we were still a liberal party. The liberal wing, this is the coalition, four conservative factions, all sharing that same notion that society is a moral order that must be defended. Its security must be defended to maintain the existing order. It's a moral order. That's conservatism. So we have four different ones and one that used to be the party that's now one of five, one of five factions in the party. That's a true coalition. Separate factions get together together not necessarily permanently, but for a shared goal, like winning the presidential election. So that's a picture of a coalition. We could talk about the New Deal coalition when you come up and join my class or Walter's class and have the whole semester to talk about some of those other things. But this is what, what happened was that the majority dominant wing all through Reagan was the libertarian wing, that left faction number one over there, and these others were not only growing, but finding a basis to share a common movement called conservatism, called the Conservative Coalition, in fact. And it was on that basis that they brought about that spectacular victory in 1994. And by that time, they had become very in, insecure, more than that, in con, it, it just totally impatient with the Republican Party because they were getting lip service for the demands that they had formed a coalition to pursue. Reagan they could live with because they had faith in, his, in, in Reagan. George Bush failed to do that. He was attacked more by the, the right wing of his own party than by the Democrats. Lap dog, George Will called him. They all attacked and several people ran against him for the nomination and opposed him in the election. They were coming forward and their victory validated this coalition in 1994. But it also transformed, so we can call it morphing or transmogrification. Following, putting the things together from 1994 onward, it became a conservative party. Now, there's an ironic twist here I'd like to tell you about. It's another story. It's a romance. It's a love story. Just as the American Republican Party was morphing, it morphed into a Tory conservative British party. The description of conservatism I gave you comes out, the word conservative was coined for the approach that the Tory party took in the late, uh, late 18th and early 19th century. Conservative meaning hierarchy, established practices, tradition, executive power versus parliament. They were, and it's the Whigs who backed the parliament and so on. So this Republican party became a conservative party like a Tory conservative party. That's our Republican party now. It morphed into that. Meanwhile, Maggie Thatcher, who fell in love with Ronald Reagan, morphed her conservative party into an American Republican party. Free market, all this stuff. The Democratic Party became like that old Juan Liberal Party in Great Britain. <coughs> and so did the Republican Party of the United States disappear into its morphed version. And I find that quite ironic. I love it that we're now the Tory party. We have a Tory party and the British have a, a Republican party. And what the Labor Party is, Tony Blair also became a Republican during that time. And so powerful was this coalition that Bill Clinton became the last Republican president of the 20th century. Why? Because he had enough political sense and enough sense of history to see he could not govern except in terms of the hegemonic agenda. And what was hegemonic in the 90s and into the, 20, into the, the teens, the, the 2000s, is precisely the dominant agenda was the conservative agenda. And Clinton became the manager of the conservative agenda. 
And so if you look, and I give you that, I won't go into it, but the other side of your printout is a fairly good, not exhaustive, picture of Bill Clinton's record. And it looks just like the contract with America with more. Except he had did one thing they didn't do. He reduced the deficit. Isn't that weird? That even made him more Republican. <laughs> He's much more Republican than the present Republican Party is. He reduced expenditure. He reduced even the personnel. He even did some deregulating. Ask Fred Kahn. He, they got more after Fred left office than they had before because they had Bill Clinton. So I won't stop there. That's the present situation. We have a conservative party, genuine conservative party. And it's truly be called red, meaning it has a unitary quality, whether we want to call it red. That used to mean communist. But why they pick red and blue, Kathy? I don't know. But those colors, that's weird. I don't know. It should be white. You want to answer that, don't you? I can almost answer it. I, I, yeah, I can't, why don't you? I can't completely answer this it. This doesn't count on yeah, my time. Uh, right. It's just <laughs> right. It's pictures up anyway. There was actually no, a, it's not yeah, a, it, almost. I get the elderly advantage here. <laughs> Better yeah. answer. There was actually a time when, when I think one of the networks had the colors reversed, but they're very bright colors, and a choice was made. I think R for Republicans, so that's a that's a reason for red. The other is alphabetical: Democrats, yeah. Republicans. Do you not like those? Actually, you got to change the colors. And if the Democrats were it red, it should be it orange should be. and yellow. Right. Orange for the Republicans after oh, Cheney uh, and yellow for the Democrats for what they are. That's the colors there ought to be. Let me finish now. Let me finish, if you please. And I do get an elderly manage here, uh, uh, an elderly advantage a little bit. I'm going to bring it up to date. That's why you have to let me go a little long. I don't know. I haven't gone 15 minutes. No, you're okay. Right. How am I going to stop you? We anyway? can't stop here because it is so dominant at the moment that wherever morality and politics is dominant, it trumps utility. That's why liberals can't speak. That's why they are the one shadow of what it had been in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and part of the 60s. Because when, mor when morality dominates the discourse, you can't just think of the votes in Congress. You cannot vote against mama and apple pie. You can't vote against values. You can't vote against security. You can't vote against morality and, and all the things for which Republicans stand. I call their regime hypocrisy instead of hypocrisy. In other words, crassy meaning form of government by deceit. But nevertheless, that's what morality is about. You must deceive because you can't live up to what you do. But it works, and the Democrats can't vote against it. So as a consequence, I'll give you one set of figures that you can remember because they're very simple, and there are not many of them here, that between 2000 and 2004, you can just see the effect of morality, which compares to 1896. We haven't had a morality movement that dominates the discourse to the extent that 1896 dominated. It was from the left more than the right in that period of time. It doesn't matter. There are 30 red states in terms of the, the, the definitions being given here. 30 red states and 20 blue states in both 2000 and 2004. The number of states where the victory of, the, of Bush was 10% or more margin, which is already a decisive victory, there were 19 of those in 2000 and 24 of those in 2004, where the majority in the, in the popular vote was as wide as 10%. In the, Democrat, in the blue states, went from 10 down to 8 in those where there was decisive victories. So where morality comes in, you start getting tendencies toward one-party states. Even though you can still get some close votes, you get one-party states in the sense of the overwhelming quality of some of the margins such that it's not worth campaigning for the other party. If you have to overcome a 10. Now let's go to one more, which is in, if you take the same 30 red states and pick a higher margin, 20% or more, 11 states in 2000 and 17 states in 2004 had margins of victory of 20% or more. The blue states in 2000 had three states with more than a 20% margin, and in 2004, the same three 20 states had that. So what we have now is an epoch of morality, I don't know how else you can call it, that dominates the discourse. The only, the only opportunity for sunlight in this is that each of these four factions should have a little space. That line there is just a seam that Lee Adwater called the Democratic Party seams in that 1970s, 1960s for Richard Nixon. And how they won was to put wedges down those seams to tear the coalition apart. 
That's the opportunity the Democrats have, if they had any sense at all, to use wedge issues, and I can think of only two of those to use, and we'll let that happen when we've got time in discussion. But anyway, the wedge issues are all there is to break the party apart along the seams in this business. If that should happen, there may be a chance that utility, the end of hypocrisy and the beginning of a plain old ordinary selfishness may come back to politics again, and all I can say is I raise my glass to utility against morality. That's 2008. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ted. And, and I suggested you might be taking a nap during that. <laughs> uh, I'd like first, uh, first of all, I want to thank the panelists for, for very enlightening uh, presentations. I told you so. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is uh, offer the opportunity to any of the panelists to respond uh, to uh, any of the outrages uh, committed by any of the others. Uh, and then I would like, after a certain amount of that discussion, to allow the people in the audience uh, uh, to uh, offer uh, questions or comments. So uh, anybody in the panel want to uh, yeah, I do. pick up first? Yeah, I do. I didn't mean I, you. I, I didn't mean you. I'm all worked up. Now, you, you, you can't maybe stop artificially. I just want to make a comment about the case that, that uh, former Representative uh, uh, Frost was, was involved in. They're too lily-livered to really make a big case. You make one case against gerrymandering, but the real evil is what made gerrymandering possible and has been that way since Eldridge Jerry. And Clinton Rossiter used to correct us. His name was Jerry, not Gary. G Gary and not Jerry, so it should be gerrymandering. That was one of Clint's right. ploys back there in those days. You have to attack the evil where it is, which is the single-member district system. That's the biggest obstruction to American democracy, the single-member district system. You could get rid of all the, the uh, profound corruption in American politics if you got rid of it. And it, I can demonstrate, but not here, that it can be shown to be unconstitutional as applied, just like... Uh, capital punishment was in 1976. I'd just like to make that observation that good luck to your case, but it ain't strong enough for me, sir. <laughs> I presume you can also tell us how that can be achieved. Bring suit. That's all you can do. You bring suit under the First Amendment, that it blocks every minority, however you measure it. It doesn't have to be black or Hispanic. Any subdivision that gets regularly less than one point over the plurality in the election is silenced and not represented. That's how you do it. Walter, you want to make a comment? Anyway, I didn't want to change the whole discourse, but yeah, right. I didn't want to Or, that or anything. Right. There's, an, <laughs> there's an extremely interesting debate which is occurring in the political science literature now about gerrymandering. Uh, <laughs> uh, John Londrigan is the other person who says gerrymander with that look oh, in his good. eye. Um, I say clear. gerrymander. I learned that in school. Um, but the issue has to do with whether the you know, gerrymandering and Reynolds v. Sims in particular is a, is a source of the incumbent advantage. And so it's frozen electoral competition in the Congress um, in that way. Though, on the other hand, of course, Reynolds v. Sim has been the engine of, in a sense, overcoming exactly the ill which you just diagnosed, at least for some minorities, because it's the key tool that drives the, uh, the definition and enforcement of the Voting Rights Act in a lot of ways. And so it's an extremely uh, nettlesome and complicated uh, area to wander into. Um, it's hard to be as excited or excitable as Ted, um, but... Um, it's hard to be that way. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, the Senate. How's that? I only say the, God damn it when you start to fall asleep, all right? <laughs> Otherwise, no. All right. The thing that I find most uh, troubling about American politics, and from an electoral point of view, of course, is the fact that Wyoming, a state with... I, um, fewer people than California, both Wyoming and California have two senators, and this strikes me as profoundly problematic. But more importantly, when you see these maps on election night with the red states and the blue states, and you see the whole country all in red and these little slivers on the coast in blue, of course the blue is where uh, as many or more people are as in the big empty red states. And so there's an optical illusion that goes on there, and I think there's a problem with the discourse that talks about states as if they were um, objects of pol or legitimate political representation. Constitutionally, they clearly are, 
And so you simply can't denounce the states and move away from them. There's a very complicated, long argument about the legitimacy of the Senate in Wyoming, pesky little Wyoming is in there. Uh, apparently they have lots of money. I read in the New York Times and are about to turn into an engine for something. Um, but it's a real problem that's only likely to get worse and uh, something that might be underlying the kinds of trends that I talked about uh, that Jeff Satch was looking at is people leaving Kansas um, for places where there's more economic opportunity um, for young people and other talent. And so you're getting these movements away and so even fewer people and even less economically, was it greedy was the word that Ted uh, Lowy used, uh, people in these uh, other states and more culturally sensitive uh, folks to, of course, lagging cultural values and not necessarily prospective coming cultural values. So there are a variety of, I think, difficulties involving states in American politics, and I won't even mention the Electoral College. Um, there's, there's probably, it's probably worth having some discussion about the role of, of campaigns in, in creating a situation where the differences in the strong Republican states and the strong Democratic states have become so so large and so and so extreme. I mean, it, it, it is the case that the the parties spent almost no money in in those states, mm -hmm. and it is also the case that that report, news reports um, over and over again said that the parties were spending no money there because the expectation is that these are Republican states or these are Democratic states. And, and that may have some impact on how citizens view their, view their vote. It doesn't seem to have hampered turnout in the 2004 election, but it may, it may have, have affected the way people, people, people see their, what they're expected to do. And, and so that combined with, as you mentioned, people moving out of places um, that may be more conducive to their to their ideology and to their political point of view is is clearly exacerbating maybe ex exacerbating this. I I, I also want to say something about about um, new television coverage of of elections because there really has been a move in the last two elections to try to do more than just show the red states and blue states and try and demonstrate the differences within the states and using three three dimensional displays of votes in, in say, Los Angeles County. So you have a tower of, of blue and these little, this little very low <coughs> plateau of red surrounding it. I don't know, um, I don't know whether that comes across to, to, to most viewers, but, but the, the, the attempt is there to try and, and balance out the, the geographic view that we have, because a map is, is just a piece of geography, um, and, and balance that out with actually some sense of what the, of what the population is. Um, may, may I just say something? You mentioned 1896, and, and I love the election coverage in the, in the last part of the, of the 19th century, because um, news organizations, in that case newspapers, were really into being first, um, it, to the point of taking out advertisements that said that they were able to tell people how people voted sooner than their competition. Now, they did this in extreme ways. Um, one newspaper told, um, told people ahead of time they'd be shining beacons into the sky in one direction if the Republican won and shining them in the other direction if the Democrat won. And there even is a report of, I think it is the New York Times putting up a map outside its offices in New York City, which of course people came to Times Square to watch, and lighting up the states in red or blue. <laughs> If, and this is this is like 1900, um, and lighting up the states in red and blue when they knew how the, what the what the outcome was. So we have a really long history. It's of, true. Of this. It's, it's true. I'm glad you're sensitive to that. Well, uh, Carl, you wanted to comment. Yeah, I, I, passing up the opportunity to respond to the attempt of Professor Lowy to put slanderous words into my mouth about Dallas. Um, <laughs> right. Good. The, I want to ask Kathy a question about polling. Well, two things about polling. One is I always thought that the reason that the, that the Democrats were blue and not red was something to do with the, the networks didn't want to portray the Democratic Party as red, mm -hmm. too liberal, et cetera, et cetera. It could have been one of the reasons, but there are multiple reasons. There are, there are multiple reasons that people remember now. But my real question is, can you address yourself to the criticism that polling has something to do with the phenomenon that you were talking about? And how do we know that a state isn't in play and that there's no chance for one party to win? We know because there are polls. And if we didn't have polls, we wouldn't be so sure that uh, certain states were not in play. Now, I'm not sure we can get rid of all polls, but poll some people feel that polling has a negative effect on political discourse. And, and 
I know in 1952 or even as late as 1972, we weren't 100 percent sure how elections were going to turn out um, because we didn't have a poll every minute and candidates actually went to states where they thought they might have a chance where they turned out they didn't. But Well, I mean, uh, even in 1960, Richard Nixon came under a lot of criticism for his promise to visit every single right. state, which he did to the detriment of, of, of his campaign in the right. states that really mattered. So, um, so I think it's probably fair to say that people had some sense of, of, of how states were going to go, even if they only relied on, on, on the history of the state, um, predating the kind of polling that we, that we see today. Um, I, I, I think, though, that, that some of, so, so some of this is history and some of this is known. Um, you know, if, if there were no such things as polls in Mississippi, and there are hardly any, we all know that Mississippi is going to be a red state in 2008. Um, we, we can also, you know, say that Wyoming is going to be a red state in, 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 in 2008, and those are not states where there's a multitude of, of public opinion surveys. Um, I think that, that I don't think we should conflate two different things. I mean, one thing is that, that campaigns have always used devices to try and figure out um, who's voting for who and, and, and where they should be concentrating their resources. Poll books in the, in the 19th century in the, in the, in the Midwest. Um, so this is, not a, this is not a brand new thing. So it, absent the technique of public opinion polls, there would be other devices that would be, that would be used to do this. And you know, you could use newspaper editorials. You <coughs> might mean that newspaper editorials would mean more in, a different, in, a, in, a, in an age without all this, all this technology. Um, but you could, you could certainly, you would do it. And you know, in a way, if you're going to do it and if you're going to make those decisions, you might as well have pretty good data to do it, do it with. I want to say also, um, maybe not over the immediate short run, but over the moderate run, um, the red and blue state designation changes. Parties shift. Issues change. There's a very nice paper that came out in the American Political Science Review, I think it was last, 2004, um, by uh, Norm Schofield and, um, and Miller uh, out, of, um, out of Washington University that showed that if you look back to 1896 or in that era, the states that are strong Democratic states now and the states that are strong Republican states now are about 100 percent reversed. It's about exactly the opposite, um, the map, from what it was 100 years ago. And there's a kind of career of the states as you move around, and there are some very interesting theories about explaining why the parties, based on the shifting internal factions and coalitions, would dynamically move over time. And so even though in this moment people even pin down little Wyoming uh, or big geographic Wyoming and little population Wyoming as a, you know, Republican state, I wouldn't say it's likely to be that in 20 more years and certainly not uh, going further than that. Um, it may be that, uh, as I understand it, I read the newspapers on this, I don't have any inside information at all, I believe that the Democratic National Committee under Howard Dean is making an effort to organize in all 50 states um, with some kind of an organization. Um, for fundraising purposes and campaign purposes and mobilized folk, and I understand that he or they are getting a lot of flack for that from some quarters who take a more narrow view of what the interests of the country, uh, let alone the Democratic Party, are for this comprehensive political mobilization. But I think carrying the fight out of you know, the five precincts in Ohio and Florida that may turn the next presidential election is absolutely essential for uh, American democracy, and uh, there may be some sign that that's happening uh, on the Democratic side, um, and I don't know what's going on on the Republican I wanna, side. I want to move on with Walter's observation about how there seems to be a reversal in the distribution of what's called red and blue, and that's very important. And I'd like to pick up on a point that I just slid by fast, given the time, the guillotine coming down, which is that morality had a lot to do with the kind of, re of, of thing that made 1896 and the immediate uh, uh, future after that. Morality had the same influence that it has now, but in the reverse direction. Morality at that time was mobilized more by what we now call the left, coming out of farmer labor movements, uh, new immigration, and so on and so forth. So the morality that dominated the discourse, which is normal in a liberal politics, did create the North two one-party states. The South was overwhelmingly democratic. It was useless. I can remember in, back in Gadsden, Alabama, as a kid, they used to say, last night the Republican Party met on the corner of Broad Street and Forest Avenue <laughs> in, the phone book, in the phone booth. And, and uh, that, there were so few Republicans there. And in the North, less so, a little more competition was the left side, the, the industrial side, and so on and so forth. The reverse is that morality this time is mobilized from the right, 
meaning true conservatism. I don't even like the words left and right, true conservatism. And so the response is, in a sense, reversed, given our own uh, rigidity in how we make separations, the red and blue thing. So just bear in mind that one constant throughout this thing, and it shows up in the polls when they ask the appropriate questions, is this interaction between a moral discourse and a utilitarian discourse. And I think that's a very important thematic, both in terms of political theory and in terms of political opinions and political thought. I, I want to ask Ted to tell us the two wedge issues that the Democrats can, <laughs> can use. Yeah. I, I think I probably had three or four in mind. I just wanted to tease you. I probably don't have any. Oh. But the biggest one, <laughs> no, the biggest one is hypocrisy. And I call it, in, by the way, the second edition is coming out in May, and it'll be a well-kept secret in publishing history, so go look for the second <laughs> edition. You may have to go on the web to find it, but it's coming out. The biggest one, I think, is what I call hypocrisy, meaning hypocrisy with a C-R-A-C-Y. C-R-A-C-Y means form of rule by, hippo meaning, in this case, by deceit, by pretending to be something and a good something that you aren't. That's the biggest wedge of all. The other wedge is, of course, the impeachment of George Bush. There is a real, definite in, uh, commission, deliberate one, a violation of law very much like the impeachment of Andrew Johnson, a deliberate violation of the law, where his claim was he's above the law, I'm the one who decides when the war is over, et cetera. And if the U.S. Congress, I mean, if the Democratic Party took one issue, one contract with America, and make impeachment the referendum issue in this campaign, that's a wedge. That will wedge throughout all four of these because hypocrisy covered with, colored with honesty on the one thing that makes him declare the presidency is an imperial uh, unified imperial institution. Those are the two edge issues that I had in mind. This might be a good uh, time to ask the audience to uh, weigh in on some of these things. This is a gentleman who's been raising his hand now for at least 10 minutes. <laughs> there, there is a mic that's good that we can hand through the audience. Thank you. I enjoyed this. Um, Speaking of wedge issues, all you have to do is look on the front page of the papers. Immigration is a huge wedge issue for Republicans right now. Um, if you want to look at serious wedge, wedge, wedge issues, I think. Um, but I think when you're talking about red and blue, one of the things that's always troubling is that this is based on the Electoral College, which was finally mentioned, um, and a presidential vote, which is not the same as political parties. And we've been talking about Wyoming, Kansas was mentioned. Those are two states that are red states, yet they have Democratic governors. Arizona is another. If you take a different measure of red and blue, I think you have a very different political landscape, one that we really haven't been talking about here. And there is a lot of change going on. There is a lot of purple out there. Uh, it's, it's that we are fixated on these presidential <coughs> elections that somehow are representative of how strong the parties are in these various states. But really, they may be a function of presidential strength and presidential candidacy, uh, strength of those presidential candidates. And I just was interested in some comments. Well, let me just say that, that you make a good point, and that's uh, certainly the case. I think that one factor, and there, there may be others, is that many state elections are really fought out on practical state issues, state taxes, who's governing the state well, whereas national elections tend to be more ideological, certainly in, in recent years. And um, so that the red-blue, you know, on the national level reflects, it, it's sort of an ideological division um, between the two parties, which has grown. Um, the, both are much less, you know, have cover a much narrower spectrum than they once did, where state elections tend to be somewhat less ideological, at least at the governor's level. What you find happens sometimes is that someone will get elected governor, say a Democrat in a conservative, what we consider conservative state, when that person tries to run for the Senate, and then has to state his issue, his position on national issues that are more ideologically runs into some difficulty. Yes, sir. One aspect that's not been covered is the appeal to the marginal voter. It was an article of faith for Karl Rove that if you could get those people who, in, in his case, the overly born who did not normally vote and to raise their participation, uh, this and it seems to have worked, for example, in Florida in 2004 as compared with 2000. Has any research been done on those who still are outside the political process and on which issues might draw them into it and who would benefit? Mm, that's a wonderful question. You know, one of the problems is is that is that we look at um, at at the electorate <clears throat> and 
when we talk about all these people who are not not voters, it's actually in truth a much smaller percentage than we than we see. Um, because the, the actual eligible population is not the 18 plus population and all the turnout figures you see most of them are, are calculated based on based on that so um, so there are there are relatively few of those people <coughs> now really to pull in the the, the more mobile um, in the in the society for sure young adults who are not yet coming into the haven't come into the system yet haven't haven't thought about it um, and um, and and so I think that that there there are places people can go but it's a it's a it's a shrinking it's a shrinking pool I mean the Republican Party um, the ability to bring in uh, Christian conservatives um, and to get the get people who were otherwise outside of the political system into the political system had clearly made a made a very very big big difference. Um, and, um, you know, the point was made that they didn't vote in 2000, so, but they had voted before. So it wasn't like getting new people, it was getting people back into the fold for the 2004 election. One of the great myths in American politics is that there is a, this great number of people out there who are inordinately democratic and that if you only had a bigger turnout, the Democrats would be sure to win. Well, you had a pretty big turnout in 2004, and guess what? Um, a lot of the extra people who turned out turned out to vote Republican. Let so. me endorse that. This does vary. The marginal voter is a real thing, but it's a bit of a myth as to what its makeup is. There are times when good advice is for the Democrats, go out and build that marginal vote because they're all these workers and so on who, who are disappointed or who or whatever. But the point is, the marginal voter can also, the same people can be, can be mobilized, though marginal, by an appeal toward the morality bid. So it depends on the occasions and the issues and the the prevailing ideology, the prevailing mood of the country as well as anything else. So sometimes you can know which side will gain not by knowing what the dominant discourse is, but we shouldn't put a single label on the marginal voter precisely because they are even more responsive to the near-run issues than those who are regulars and have an affiliation with a party that gives them another set of more standard criteria to judge from. I, I remember 1984 after the election when we um, did a survey of non-voters and, and looked at the preference. Well, had you voted, who, you, who would you have voted for? And the result was that, that Ronald Reagan would have, would have carried them by a significant margin. And I remember phone calls from sociologist friends of mine who told me this just can't be right. Um, it must be wrong. Um, <laughs> so, so we've because of the, the traditional view that, that the people who are outside the system are going to be Democrats, are going to be poor laborers who, who will vote their economic conscience, and it wasn't true in 84, and there are times in recent years when it also hasn't been true. Yeah, in 2004 was a mobilization, get out the vote battle. That's what it was mainly about. Um, and in, you mentioned Florida, but also in Ohio. That was the story in Ohio. 100% um, that was the story in Ohio. And the Democrats were surprised and disappointed that their efforts fell short. Um, and no one was, well, some were surprised and horrified, but no one was generally surprised at the success of the Republicans there. And they used existing social networks and remobilized some people who had voted before, which is widely documented to be the best way to get voter turnout up. There is a class of voters, however, of course, who would be likely Democrats who are excluded, and that's ex-felons. And uh, there's a big movement now in Florida. This is especially momentous where various outcomes in the state election and the presidential election would almost certainly be different if you did not have ex-felons disenfranchised there. So I think the generalities that have been stated by the panel, which probably are true in the abstract, are probably not true of Florida uh, based on that population. Would the ex-felons outnumber the would-be felons? <laughs> we may be approaching a, a climate in which the Republicans may be more willing to agree to enfranchising <laughs> felons. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, no comment. Wait, another question here. <laughs> I, have a serious con I have a serious concern living in Bethesda and, wa and reading the Washington Post and lobbying in Maryland that this country is now for sale. We no longer care about our education, our health or our economics. Immigration has become um, a, uh, an emotionally charged issue rather than the economic issue it is. You have a whole group of people that are willing to work for less than minimum wage. Employers are willing to pay 30 percent less for people who don't pay taxes, don't put into the economic system from which they're drawing out, and nobody really seems to want to discuss reality, other than my feeling is that the employers probably tip money to the Republican Party, and let's keep the status quo. And, and the 
poor public is given the issue of discrimination versus discrimination or non-discrimination against immigrants when it really is keeping the American poor poorer. I, I think we haven't seen how the immigration issue is going to play out in this election. I mean, it's clearly coming to the to to prominence right now. Um, it's an issue that divides Republicans. It's, it's an issue that doesn't sort of break naturally among among partisan lines in terms of 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 positions on it. And I think you know we'd probably be better able to comment on 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 it as an as an issue perhaps a month from now once once Congress went through. Yeah, Paul Krugman has a couple of columns lately on this, and I'm sure he knows much more about it than I do. Um, and it goes right to the heart of his support in his scholarly work of uh, free trade and so on. And he says the effects are small. Um, the negative effects are, as you say, concentrated among the um, less skilled, poorer people in America. Um, and leaving now Paul Krugman behind, uh, even given that analysis, I'm not sure what the right political diagnosis is. In a sense, it's misdirection. It seems to me the issue is low-skilled Americans who can't get better jobs, which goes back to problems in schools and um, <clears throat> neighborhoods where people can't get out of them, and um, felons and criminalization of uh, young blacks in America, which have nothing to do with immigration as an issue directly. And so you have a debate that is, in some cases, using those ills to to fuel an immigration uh, battle, but I think a more rich, in, I don't know where the solution is for that, but I think you also <coughs> do not have an adequate discussion of these other problems that would actually solve the economic problem. And I think this goes back to the what's wrong with Kansas idea, that the political debate has been hijacked by these so-called cultural issues, and you don't get a serious debate about the economic um, changes and the degree to which government public policy can intervene in a variety of ways to, uh, to, uh, to make these corrections. Let me jump in on this, too. Okay. Republicans were always in favor of free immigration. We didn't even have passports until after World War I. We were always permeable as a country, and liberalism, <laughs> liberals favored it because it did, did keep the price of labor down. It was, you know, melting pots and all that were sentimental add-ons, but it was, it was keeping uh, things down. But the, the answer was unionization. The answer was artificial imposition by control of the labor market, by laborers themselves. And what we should be doing now is not worrying about the influx of labor. That gets very racist after a while because why are we nice about the Canadians and not about the Mexicans? What we should be doing is minding our own business by, first of all, helping labor return itself while it's going down, 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 especially with the, un, the unskilled and the, and the manual laborers. And at the same time, instead of putting a billion dollars or so in a fence, put a billion dollars in some work down there just across the damn border. I don't see anybody talking about that. Where in the hell are the Democrats? I mean, here I was saying we need wedges against the Republicans. They'll just simply join the stupidity of the Democrats. I'm a very nonpartisan, anti-party person. They're both wrong. So it's not a matter of being, uh, you know, shedding tears over these guys. It's what we should do to our own house. Uh oh, there's Sylvie. We knew we couldn't keep him quiet the whole time. I, I, Speak up, Joel. Don't be shy, Joel. <laughs> it's okay, Joel. <laughs> Yes, yeah. What would President Barrow do? Or, or President Anderson, I, I, I should one say. One more economics. All right. Yeah. Uh, All right. I He's just trying have, to be mean. I have one more question. <laughs> you talk about the uneducated. The educated are underemployed. I am a physician. Four of my colleagues and I quit when we were making sixty, fifty, and twenty-five thousand dollars as internists. Computer people cannot get jobs. We are talking about the educated as well as the uneducated. We are talking about so many levels of contract, and New Orleans is the prime example where your uneducated could be employed if there were not 17 layers of contracts. So you have a myth that it's only the uneducated that can't get work. We need to topside improve everything. Thank you. Here's a gentleman who's been trying to get into Please. Jeff, yes. Yeah. Uh, you could say a little bit more about the role of the national news in influencing public opinion. You talked a lot about talk radio, but uh, I would be surprised if most Americans 
there's a constituency there that's always been there that's listened to talk radio. But I would be surprised if it has an, an influence on the majority of Americans. And my impression is that the way in which reality is presented on the network news and in the national media generally is, is a, a very big factor in, say, President Bush's approval rating, of, to take an example. And also perhaps in the increasingly ideological character of Republican and Democratic opinion because you don't have, it seems, as much influence from the local and state media anymore. People are getting their view of political reality from the national media. And I think voters aren't, and voters don't march to the tune of what they hear on CNN commentary or talk radio. Some of them do, but most don't. But it's more important how the media portrays the character of President Bush or of candidate Kerry or what's going on in Louisiana or in Iraq. That seems to me to be a much more important influence on public opinion. And I wondered if you couldn't comment on that in the context of the increasing polarization of Republican and Democratic views on, on issues and uh, candidates. Thank you. Uh, well, I just want to correct something. I, I would never say that most yeah. people respond to talk radio. I, and and, and I, I think that, however, that it was an incredibly effective mobilizing tool in the 1994 election. And that, you know, as a new phenomenon is, is, is something that was, that, that, that appealed to a certain subset of the, of the public. Um, it really did make a difference in that, in that 1994 election. Um, so, you know, basically, I mean, one, one interpretation of it was that it acted in the way that old labor unions used to do in terms of getting out the vote on election day. It was a new way of doing it from um, a more national, national perspective. Um, it's certainly the case that, that the public responds to what they see, um, and, and, but, but, but in particular uh, to events, events coverage and, 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 and sort of longer term uh, views of, of what's going on. The two low points in approval uh, for this president came one um, last fall at the end of, at, 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 it, it was in our survey, I, I remember this, several things happened. Um, um, Libby was indicted, um, there was the Abramoff story, Harriet Myers withdrew her nomination, and there was a rising death toll in Iraq. Um, all of those things sort of working at once to impact um, me some people's view of the administration. And more recently, um, in the new low point, which is now here in, in March of 2006, uh, also a confluence of a, of a variety of things. The, the Dubai ports deal and the, and the, um, and the, and the rejection of it, um, more discussion of the, of the, of the six-month anniversary in, of, of Hurricane Katrina, um, the, um, the, uh, again, a rising, a rising death toll in, in, in Iraq. So all of these things sort of coming together. Oh, and it was two weeks after Cheney's um, incident in, uh, in Texas. Um, so so I, certainly, I, I certainly agree that events and, and the, 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 the presentation of it can affect, can affect opinion. But I think you're asking um, a broader question, which is something that um, is, is really something that needs to be addressed sort of looking at, at, at long term with, with very serious content analysis of the, of the presentation. Um, it's also the case that, that we, we, we neglect to think about it, but I do think that oftentimes local news, television news, has more viewers than the network broadcasts. And the network broadcast, the broadcast network broadcasts, the ABC, NBC, CBS, um, the viewership, though it's been declining, is you know sometimes ten times that of the CNN, uh, the CNN, the the the, the Fox, the the MSNBC um, put together. So so we 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 think about the other because it's always there, and because certain of us turn to that because it's always there. Um, but um, but that that the 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 visibility to the to the public is is sort of in quite a different. Different matter. So I'm not prepared to answer the long term. Yeah. The long term question. Two 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 points on, on that. One is that uh, people react to national coverage through their own through their own prism of their own views. Um, they're critical of it if they don't like. They'll be critical of the coverage of Bush, which is when Bush is having trouble. That means they're a pro-Bush person. They don't like to see Bush in trouble. 
um, and it goes the other way too. And the other is real events really do shape. The higher visibility something has, the more national as opposed to something very local, the more the real thing affects how people react. My stepson, who is a, is a swing voter, he wasn't, no one on television told him that he decided he didn't want to look at John Kerry for four years and thought he looked like an undertaker. Uh, John Kerry did that all by himself. <laughs> Let me just add about events that's being important here, and that is there are some events that the president can control or that the central national organization can control. And Democratic and Republican presidents know this. There's one thing that will increase polls and improve their general condition toward Congress and everybody else who takes public opinion seriously. And that is an international event related to the president. And presidents can make themselves related to it. And you're going to see another instance of it in 2000. Uh, six, just as you did in 2004, and there may be another goddamn war before the 2008 election or something that builds insecurity. The one thing presidents could depend on is a booming up of their uh, opinion polls the minute that an international event threatening us through the president occurs. So that does affect uh, opinion, sure. I've been trying to recognize you now for quite a while. <laughs> If you were to draw up a uh, diagram comparable to the one that you did for the ideological components of the conservative coalition, if you did that for the liberal coalition, would you have the same uh, source uh, material that you're drawing from as far as uh, would, it, would it come so easily or as strongly? Uh, you know, often, uh, I, particularly from conservatives, you hear that liberals are uh, bankrupt for ideas and, you know, morally, ethically lost. Uh, morally lost, not ethically lost. Oh, <laughs> okay. But anyway, I, I mean, it looks like uh, all the factions you draw from the both the left and right wing of the conservative coalition, there is a solid uh, source that they're looking to uh, that uh, is the basis for, I guess, their ideas and uh, policies. Come to Cornell and we'll spend some real time together on this. Yes, there is another... Uh, a graph. This was the relevant one here, but let me say just in short. Republicans sold their soul to Jesus or to God, and Democrats sold their soul to Mammon. So the coalition of the Democratic Party has elements of ideology in it, but there are units of economic interest that make up the, the New Deal coalition. What it's going to look like when they get their coalition together again, I don't know. But the coalition that ran this country and had a hegemonic agenda for 40 years was the New Deal coalition. And you make a map of that, there are units of uh, heavy industry, units of new technology, units of international finance, units of various California people and so on. These are economic units we can deal with. These are ideological units which makes it a very unusual coalition. And the only one I can think of, and they're not exactly the same, you have to go back over 100 years to get to 1896. I don't say they're identical, but that's the only time we've had this since maybe Tom Jefferson and the... Uh, and the, uh, the Jefferson... You're argument. talking about yeah. William Jennings Bryan, the cross of gold? Is I'm that talking <laughs> about that as a reflection of the mobilization of morality that came from organized labor, agriculture as a class, various things that made up the late 19th century. That's the first time then that morality bubbled up and became nationalized. We've always had morality and conservatism down there where politics and morality exist. It's rare for it to become a national movement, and it did once in a century, I suppose. We're going through that now, but the Democrat coalition doesn't look the same as this. They're there's, not opposites. There's a struggle in America regarding equality. Uh, there's a well-known piece called The Fear of Equality by a uh, once well-known Yale professor. Um, in the era of legal segregation in this country, which was a, a long period, um, there was a fight that happened that was part of, a kind of contested part of the New Deal, that pushed for political equality. And in a sense, that was a successful effort culminating in the big changes in the 1960s in terms of the law. And then, of course, you had to have court cases and policies to continue that. But once the victory was achieved um, in, the, in the 60s and into the 70s on the core political equality issue, the kind of steam went out of the sails in that sense. Others picked up the equality issue. It went from discrimination against blacks to, you know, the women's movement and then the gay rights movement and then all the ethnic identity movements uh, which carried into the 80s and the multiculturalism debates and so on. But that didn't really coalesce into a political kind of configuration and it's, 
it's hard in America, given that Americans are profoundly, was greedy the word that you used, it's hard to sustain a support for equality as a political tool when you're not facing a manifest evil as you faced with legal segregation. So I, I think the Democrats are still profoundly moral in the sense of committed to equality, at least some Democrats are, but it's hard in America to stand up for equality and be considered moral. But with a minister like uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. leading the uh, civil rights movement, I mean, obviously that was very ba much based in, in, in a sacred uh, uh, thinking. Uh, I was thinking more Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, particularly if it's not directed to Ted Lowy. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Hope you didn't mind that. Let me just ask about red state people and blue state people, uh, not just red states and blue states. My concern is that we're heading into a more partisan country at the people level, not just at the state level. From a red state perspective, I have to say, and I, I travel a lot between red states and blue states, that blue staters seem inherently enclosed in their blue states. Red staters seem to travel much more between them. Blue staters seem to be content living in their cities. <coughs> blue state academics sound arrogant to, reds, to empty red state people. Talk radio in red states, I think, Kathleen, boomed because they felt that the blue state media was ignoring them. Correct. I mean, it, that's what it was. It Fox was News is three to one over CNN now. It may be the country is heading more harshly blue and red, but as people, not just as states. I, I think that, that there's, there's, you're absolutely correct. I mean, th it, is, it is sort of a, a view. This is how you should, this has been covered, but this is what it is. This is how you should see it. It was a response, it was a response to perceptions of wrongness, liberalness, whatever. Um, but I, I think that, that one of the things that, that always strikes me is when I go, wherever I go, um, and talk to people in red states and blue states, these reinforcing things that keep us talking to each other and not to other people. And I think it's, it's equally true in, in red states as it is in, in, in blue states. Um, but, but I think that if you think about it, um, you've got your friends, and now it's probably more true than ever before, although this is researchable, and, and, and I'm, I'm hypothesizing here. And now it's probably true that we socialize less with people of different political views than we might have 20 <coughs> years ago. Um, it's also true that many of us can't quite imagine why other people believe the way they do. Um, I'm, I'm recalling 1998 and 1999 um, in the height of the impeachment of, of Bill Clinton, the Monica Lewinsky um, thing, and, um, and, and the phone calls that I would get from people from Nebraska who would tell me I couldn't possibly be doing a national survey because no one they knew thought the way the surveys did. And then come 2003 um, and the war in Iraq, and, and I'm getting phone calls from people in New York City and California, parts of California telling me this can't be correct, there isn't this kind of support because no one I know thinks that way. And I think we're in a, we're in a situation where because of the, 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 the there are no more cross cut there are very few cross cutting cleavages. There, there are very few things that keep us dealing with people who are not like us. Um, if we're Democrats, we're less likely to go to church than if we're Republicans. We're, la we're, we're less likely to be dealing with people. If we're, if, we're, if we're Democrats, we live in big cities. If we're, if we're Republicans, we may not. We, we, so there are Republicans in big city. I mean, there are, there are people in these different places, but they may not be as visible to, to people on the other side. And I think this is, this is definitely um, a, a trend that is, that is growing. So I, I, do, I do agree with your point. And I think that's a very good note on which to conclude. Uh, I, I want to make a joke wanna, about Ithaca. You, pardon? Ithaca. Right. <laughs> we had a big booming metropolis yeah. of Ithaca where Cornell sits, of course, is a place where we encounter red state people all the time. Well, uh, but they're in the ag school. Outside of this room, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how well that joke travels. Uh, it works in this right. room. Anyway, I want to thank the audience, and I'd like to ask the audience to join me in thanking our panel, Carl Lugsdorf, Ted Lowy, Walter Mevin, and Kathleen Frankovic.
We're going to break for 15 minutes at most and be back here and uh, Don Wolfensberger, head of the Congress project of the Wilson Thanks Center, will too. moderate the next panel. Yeah, Thank you. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. I would. I would. Well, when it's convenient, I would. Come on,